keeping us from and Sarang has been working on many topics it's hard to keep track of. Uh, I know him for his work on fluctuating hydrodynamics, but he's an expert. He's had major contributions to many other problems that I know much less about, uh, including uh, understanding integrable systems and how they also, in some sense, uh, equilibrate or thermalize. Um, also on disordered systems, many body localization. And he's also had uh, many um, ongoing collaborations with cold atom experimentalists and understanding how you know, these part of many body systems um, uh, thermalize and how you, we can observe that. And apparently he also works on monitored systems. systems. <laughs> so I'm not sure he'll be telling us about today. Uh, thank you very much, Luca. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've had um, great discussions already um, today and look forward to um, having many more. Um, right, so um, this is a um, uh, fairly long project, um, and these are the, the primary co-conspirators on this project. There's also sort of accreting many more um, collaborators as we go. Um, but um, most of what I'm going to talk about is in this paper that I've italicized. So um, let me just um, very quickly explain the basic setting that I'm going to talk about. Um, it looks like this. So, um, so we have two players, um, uh, normally you call them Alice and Bob, but one of them is an eavesdropper, so uh, she's named Eve, and the other one has to have a name, so I'm going to call him Steve. Um, so, um, so before the game begins, both players agree on some discrete set of quantum state, um, and, um, and so Steve um, randomly picks one of those states, doesn't tell Eve what it is, um, initializes a quantum many-body system with that state, um, and then and the, the system evolves according to some complicated, chaotic Hamiltonian. Um, and, um, and as the system goes, um, Eve makes a bunch of single site measurements of the system. Um, and, um, and Eve's task is to reconstruct from the measurements that she made um, what state Steve chose to initialize the system in. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the setup. And afterwards, of course, um, you know, Eve communicates her guess and is told either you got it right or you got it wrong. And so the, the question that we're asking is um, what's um, the probability, what's the, what's the best Eve can do? What's the highest probability of which she can guess the correct answer, um, both information theoretically and given some bounded set of computational resources? And, um, and the point I'm gonna make is that this, this, um, uh, this probability of correct guess um, undergoes um, phase transitions, um, and I'm going to be talking about what those phase transitions are. Okay, um, fine. Um, and so um, we, that's, where, that's where we're going to end up, but we're going to get there um, in a few steps. So first I want to introduce um, monitored quantum circuits um, and a bunch of information theoretic jargon that um, some of you um, definitely know, but some of you might not. Um, after that, I'm going to introduce this, um, this charge learning transition that I advertised, um, and then I'm going to present some experimental data on it, and I'm going to talk about sort of how it fits into a bigger picture of, um, of, of, um, of these information theoretic transitions in, um, in quantum many body systems. Um, okay, so um, uh, the basic setup we're thinking about here is an open quantum system. An open quantum system is a system, you know, the, the, the entire world is governed by some um, unitary evolution. You chop the world up into some bit that you um, call the system, and then the complement of the system is the environment. Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to use the standard quantum circuit notation where time goes up. Um, each um, vertical line is the world line of a qubit. And when I apply, for example, unitary gate involving two qubits, um, it gets a box like that. Okay, so that's that's notation. And so, okay, right now I'm not. I'm just talking about something extremely general. Um, but now, um, in order to make further progress, we decide what to do, how to think about the um, about the about the environment, which is this red um, qubit in my um, in, in, in my toy. So one thing you do is you could perform a measurement on the environment qubit. Um, and if you do that, what you do is you collapse the state of the system according to the standard measurement rules of quantum mechanics. Um, and this is what's called a generalized measurement. Um, the other thing you could do, um, the other perspective you take, is the environment to some degree of freedom to which you have no real access. Uh, it just interacts with the system and then flies off, and you never see it again. 
And in that case, what you have to do is you have to trace over the environment to get a reduced description of the evolution of the system. Um, and these two things are kind of tightly connected um, by, again, the rules of quantum mechanics, because uh, if you perform a measurement and throw out the outcome, that's just the same as tracing over the environment. So instead of making the measurement, you just sort of um, just let that, let that information fly off um, into the ether. Um, and so mathematically, that's, um, that's sort of expressed by the fact that um, if you take um, these um, collapse operators and add them all up, you get a super operator that, um, that represents um, what's called a quantum channel. A quantum channel is just the most general linear revolution that takes a legal density matrix to a legal density matrix. Okay, so it's just some very general uh, full open system evolution. And the key point is whenever you have a quantum channel, you can think about it in this way, um, as you made a measurement, as the environment was measured, and then the measurement outcome was thrown out. So, um, so that's um, so. Stop me if any of this stuff is unclear, because it's important to to what's going to come next. Um, okay. So, um, one obvious point about um, the relation between these two perspectives: if you take this sort of trace perspective, you see that I'm performing a trace over the red leg. Um, but if I um, perform a trace by unitarity, I can also perform a rotation on the on, 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 on the environment before tracing it out. And that just says that if I perform some kind of action in the environment, um, but I don't know what the environment is doing anyway, then it doesn't matter if I did it or not. So um, a different way of saying this um, is that if um, you imagine the environment um, as some adversary who's making a measurement, um, you can see that the adversary could measure in different bases. Um, and, um, and so depending on the basis the adversary measures in, the state of the system conditional the measurement outcome is going to be different. But then if you throw out the measurement outcome that you don't know which, then Alice or the, the, the black legs have no um, way of knowing what basis the measurement was performed in. And so these ensembles um, of states, if you if you average over the measurement outcomes, have to be the same because um, because there's no way for the information about the spaces to propagate it back to to Alice. Okay. Um, yeah. Why is there non-equality then? Uh, yeah, so that's because each individual term in the sum is totally different. So but if you add, if you add them all up, they're the same. So that's so this is basically if I take this if I take this trace, I can break up the trace. By this complete set of states, and depending on which complete set of states I put in, um, I get a different ensemble, but the, the average is the same. Okay, so um, the old perspective actually was precisely based on this. So when people first introduced um, this notion of, um, of, of unraveling um, the environmental trace into a set of measurements you then throw out, the idea was this is just um, a numerical convenience because much easier to do time evolution in pure states than mixed states. Um, and that was the old perspective, but um, but the past, um, I don't know, um, in, in, in the era of people actually thinking hard about quantum information, they've come to realize that, you know, the fundamental thing, if you like, is really the measurement protocol and the ensemble of states conditional the measurements. Um, and this, so this contains more information than if you did the trace. Um, but the key thing is that you need to work pretty hard to, um, to tell the difference between this ensemble of states and that ensemble of states. But in this talk, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be, we're going to be talking about, about observables and protocols that can tell the difference between, um, between the ensemble you get by measuring in one basis and, and maybe another basis. Okay? Yeah. So when you say ensemble, do you keep the classical measurement outcome? Um, yeah, so when I say ensemble in this sense, I'm keeping the classical measurement outcome in, implicitly. But we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. If you throw out, yeah, so, um, so you might say, okay, what kinds of um, objects um, care about these measurement outcomes of these unravelings? Um, it turns out there's a fairly simple way of, of, of seeing this. Um, so effectively, um, what you find is you have your ensemble of states. Um, and so, yeah, so this, this object KM is, a, is sort of a generalized projector-like object that implements a measurement. Um, and um, once you perform the measurement, you sort of project the state and then you fix the norm um, down there, okay, with the square root of the probability of the measurement outcome. Um, that's needed to make all the, the, the probabilities add up right and behave right. And now you want to compute some property of this post-measurement state. Um, and, um, and so that's going to be some function of this, uh, of this, of this projected state, projected renormalized state. Um, and, um, and so you, 
I'm, I'm writing this for pure state. You also do it, for example, if you had an ensemble of density matrices instead of, instead of an ensemble of pure states. Um, okay, so, um, so now if you take a linear function of, um, of the state, you can see that, you know, you form this thing, you average um, weighted by the measurement outcomes, the linear function. Um, you can see that if you do that, then all that you're going to do is you're going to cancel out this P of M against, um, against these two square roots that come from plugging in the state. Um, and then you just have, um, you know, what you would have gotten if you had not unraveled the measurement at all, if you just measured um, your observable in the average density matrix. So you're measuring linear functions of, um, of the post-measurement state, there's, you're not using the measurement outcomes in a non-trivial way, and, um, and it, it doesn't matter what basis you measure it. On the other hand, if you do something even kind of minimally non-linear, like, for example, consider the uncertainty of some quantity in the post-measurement state, um, then you see that the uncertainty has this piece that's linear. But it also has another piece that's the disconnected part. You normally consider boring, but it's actually very important here. This disconnected part is not a linear function of the state. And in fact, it cares very much about which basis you perform, which basis Bob performs measurements in. And, um, and this makes a lot of sense intuitively because, um, you know, if you, if you measured some observable, um, then, um, you know, the uncertainty given the measurement is zero because you figured out what the observable was, right? On the other hand, um, the uncertainty of the, the average density matrix doesn't, doesn't change, it doesn't decrease. So, so this is a this is a simple intuitive sense in which um, these in which it matters what measurement you made because, for example, the post measurement uncertainties of the state, the post measurement purity of density matrix, things like that um, do change because um, you have an information gain when you perform the measurement, record the outcome that you wouldn't have had if you didn't record the outcome. So, so that's that's the that's the key. Um, aspect of, um, of, of, of monitored circuits makes them different from conventional open systems where you don't keep track of the state of the environment. Um, okay, so um, so what we're going to talk about a lot in this talk and, and what you'll see a lot in, um, in, the, in, in this field of um, monitored quantum circuits is again this, this notion of information gain. So one, one way of thinking about information gain is let's imagine taking a maximally mixed state with our initial states. We know nothing. Um, and then we start performing measurements. And so if you didn't have unitary evolution, you just measure every site. And once you'd measure every site, you'd get a unique pure state at the end of that. And that would be um, and that would be that would be that. On the other hand, um, you know, it's not the case that every time you make a new measurement, um, you get new information. So for example, if you make, if you let's forget about um, unitary evolution for a minute, but if you measure to if you measured operators like sigma z on site one and sigma z on site five, that would give you that would, that would give you two bits of information. But if you measure sigma z on site one and sigma x on site one after that, you're not getting two bits of information. You're getting one bit of information. The second measurement um, is just erasing stuff you already learned, right? And so, in this sense, um, the general sort of intuition that um, that that one has about this is that um, if you measure commuting observables, you measure two commuting observables, you get like two separate bits of information. But if you measure two non-commuting observables, one after the other, you only get one bit of information. Um, and, um, and so um, the reason this connects up to chaotic evolution is that as many of us know, um, chaotic evolution makes operators spread. So initially localized operator um, spreads out over many sites after many steps of unitary evolution. Um, and so if you measure, if you ask, for example, did the operator I measured over here commute, the operator is going to measure over, over up there somewhere in the circuit. Um, the answer is actually given by this object, which is familiar to many of you, which is the OTOC. Um, so in general, um, in general, unitary evolution makes things that used to commute not commute anymore. Um, you know, well, they, they would have commuted at the same time, but you, you measure one thing and then you let it spread and you measure something else then um, if it sits in the shadow of the first thing you measure, you're no longer getting new information. So, so this is sort of the basic intuition as to why there are two kinds of, um, the two kinds of regime of this problem of like trying to learn information from a mixed state. There's a regime where the unitary evolution wins. And so most of the time you're not getting new information from a particular measurement. And there's a regime where the unitary evolution is negligible and just like um, basically unzip the entire state at once. And so those two, those two, um, regimes actually correspond to 
um, different phases. Um, yeah. So from this perspective, is it easier to learn about the non-chaotic system? Um, yes, it's much easier to learn about a non-chaotic system. It's not. It's still not trivial because you know you still you still have OTOX that do something. But indeed, um, if you have state free fermions, they do not have the measurement induced phase transition I'm going to talk about. They're much more susceptible um, to being collapsed because the operator has just spread so much less. Um, right. Um, and so, so, in fact, there's a phase transition that's been studied a lot over the past five years. I really should have put um, references up in this slide, but. Um, I think the first work in this was by Adam Nahum and co-workers, Matthew Fisher and co-workers, then it's been like about, um, there's been a gazillion papers since then, including by some people in the audience. Um, so there are basically two phases here. So there's one in which, um, as I was saying, the unitary evolution wins and the information gets scrambled before it can like efficiently be extracted. Um, and so, um, and so in, this, in this regime, you take a mixed state, you keep measuring and it still remains mixed. Um, on the other end, and um, similarly, um, because the chaos wins, um, initially unentangled states grow highly entangled, um, and there's a sense in which the system acts as a, a sort of emergent error correcting code because it's hiding information about the initial state from the effects of measurements. Um, when the measurement rate exceeds the critical rate, then um, you go back into a more intuitive regime where the measurements win. And so you extract all the information there is to extract about initial states and entanglement doesn't get built up because it keeps getting uh, pulled out by the collapse of the wave function due to measurements. So you always remain somehow close to a product state. And so the entanglement saturates at, uh, at, at an area law. Um, okay, um, so, that's, um, so that's why you might be interested in these um, ensembles of states where the measurement history is, um, is being kept. Um, on the other hand, um, you might also say, if you, if you sort of presented this idea um, to someone back around um, 2014, um, actually, I mean, this is not hypothetical because I remember talking about um, trajectories to people back in 2014 and they raised this obvious, and, I, and at the time I thought just like completely, um, um, completely convincing argument that in order to, in order to compute something like uh, a nonlinear function of a particular member of the ensemble, like, um, you know, let's say you want to compute this thing. Um, uh, so it's the observable conditional on a particular measurement record. You've got to generate the measurement record over and over again. Um, in a many body system, uh, this is exponentially unlikely in the space time volume of the circuit because each time you make a measurement, you could get one or two outcomes. And, um, and so, you know, re reproducing the same measurement outcome over and over again is impossible. And this is called the post selection problem. And this makes the sort of naive. Um, if you think about it naively, the phase transition is not really observable in any natural experimental um, protocol. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to um, actually tackle the post-selection problem head on. What we're going to do is we're going to use something, we're going to do something um, slightly, um, slightly less um, inefficient. We're going to use the measurement data in some way. Um, so we're going to use, we're not going to average observables, we're going to, we're going to um, correlate the observable that's measured with the previous measurement data from all the measurements we previously made and reported, okay? And that's, that's where this guessing game structure that I introduced at the beginning of the talk comes in. So um, there are two ways of thinking about this. One of them comes from theory of polymeric correction. So in polymeric correction, what you do is you, you record um, your bit string of measurement outcomes, and that's your, um, that's your error syndromes. That tells you what errors happened. And then um, once you know what errors happened, you apply this, um, this correction operation, which is some unitary operation conditional on the errors that you reported. Um, and this is, um, if you like, the decoder. And so once you've applied the decoder, you sort of moved, um, you moved the initial state back to where it used to be as you protected your quantum information against, um, against environmental decoherence. So that's how quantum error correction works. Um, but there's different um, and in some ways simpler thing you can do, which is going to be what's relevant to this talk, um, which is you're going to take this, um, you're going to take this um, observed quantity and you're going to compare it against this um, number W sub n, which is some classical function um, of the measurement data, which um, in, in my game that I was talking about, um, this, this um, expectation value is the, the actual um, 
final measurement of the of, of the state, tells you which state it was. Um, but um, this W was the guess that Alice made about what the state was. And so if you like, um, because you're correlating the past measurement data with the future measurement data, um, this is giving you some information that's not just that you wouldn't just get it, you just took this guy and averaged over all outcomes. You're averaging it with a weight that's given by some predictor. So that's that's going to be the strategy we use to try and um, and get something useful and um, and sort of uh, experimentally relevant out of this idea of um, of, of, of measurement use phase transitions. Yeah, yeah. So will W depend on O? Um, w could depend on O, but I think that in the situation, yeah, in general it will depend on O. Um, but in in this in this talk, I'm mostly going to assume that O is fixed. You'll you'll see you'll see in a in a little bit. So I'm going to fix O. And the, the action is all going to be in W. But indeed, if I were trying to predict something else, then I'd have to use a different predictor. And, and just yeah. to make sure I understand, in terms of constructing this object, so yeah. W depends on the previous measurements? Yeah, okay. precisely. It depends on the entire record of previous measurements. And in fact, I think you can show, I'm not going to show it in the story, but you can show that you need to use sort of some non-local, like full measurement history data. So you're, Use a finite amount of data about previous measurements, you can just sort of convert this entire thing into some kind of few point correlation function um, in the quantum channel, and then you wouldn't see this transition. So yeah, that, that's one thing I should say. I mean, I I, I meant to say it earlier, but um, but the, the reason why the phase transition um was only discovered a few years ago was because if you throw out the measurement data. Um, there is no phase transition here. Instead, what happens is the system, um, if you don't keep track of the measurement data, always just rapidly goes to the maximally mixed density matrix. You're making a measurement, you throw out the measurement, that's like applying some kind of dephasing operation to the system, and then over time it just gets completely dephased. So the, the fact you're keeping track of the outcome is absolutely crucial to seeing any of this physics. And so that's why we need to go through this entire rigmarole of constructing predictors and seeing if they work. And so your your object is nonlinear in the states, but um, but is is does it doesn't suffer from it, it? It doesn't require an exponential amount of yeah. It's something not nonlinear in the state, right? It's it's somehow linear and it, it's linear in a quantum sense in the state, but it's it's nonlinear in the measurement record, mm -hmm. and so that's why it gets around um, the the phenomenon of like if you throw out the measurement record, you see nothing. Well, we're not throwing it out; we're using it. We're using it in the classical sense, as opposed to a quantum sense. So the simplest way to, yeah, simplest, so if you wanted to convert this into like, I don't know, something that um, that was um, actually the nonlinear, uh, actually nonlinear function of state, then you'd pick a very simple W, which is just the indicator function of whether your measurement record was a particular bit string or not. And then you would throw out everything except that bit string and then you'd be post-selecting on that bit string. But what we're doing is we're, you know, that would be very, very inefficient, right? Because then you'd almost never see anything. But here we want to, try and get some information out of every run of the experiment. So using some other function into the predictor. Okay. So that's that's the, the general context for this um, work. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk about um, the, um, the, the protocol that we're actually gonna um, use in this, um, in the rest of this talk. Um, and so the setup, it looks kind of like this. So um, ultimately, yeah, what you have is that there's some there's some set of possible input labels. Um, uh, Steve picks one of them, um, creates an input state according to that label, um, and then that that state goes through a quantum circuit, and then um, the quantum circuit is interrupted by a bunch of measurements. Um, Eve collects the measurement data, gets some bit string out, and the thing we ultimately care about is um, the joint probability distribution of inputs and outputs. So if you're used to quantum information language, this is a version of accessible information um, that um, we're actually thinking about in this, in this talk. And so what, what Eve wants to do is she wants to maximize this conditional probability, right? So she has some prior distribution um, over what the, the input labels could have been. Um, then she makes some, then she gets, a, then she gets this measurement data um, and then um, somehow she's got to compute this conditional probability and find the likeliest label that would that would have gone in to, to and, and, and then guess that. So that's that's the that's the, the game. Um, and roughly speaking, and we'll, we'll we'll make it a bit sharper a couple of slides. Um, the idea is that um, that if Eve learns 
the the um, the label, then that corresponds to, if you like, um, a maximally mixed density matrix over these input states becoming a pure state because it got collapsed by the measurement data. Um, okay, so it's actually true in general that um, that if the if the if, if the state purifies and Eve learns it. Well, no, because you can imagine that the input data was, you know, was some kind of um, was some kind of mixed state. It was either it was either the state zero or the state one, um, and they went in with some probability. Um, but then um, Eve does something stupid and measures in the X basis. Um, so she's going to collapse the state, but she's not going to learn anything about the about the label that she was trying to learn. Um, and so um, and so we don't want to do that. And so because we want to avoid doing that, we're going to um, restrict the dynamics in such a way that, um, that there is actually a conserved label. So um, these input states are going to differ because they're eigenstates of some global operator, like in, this, in, in our example, it's going to be a global charge. So these states correspond to different global charges. And so all that Eve is trying to do is she's trying to guess the charge of um, the input state that was sent in. Okay. So that's, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, the specific game that we have in mind. Um, okay, um, and so how does she do this? Well, there's an obvious but very difficult thing that could be done, um, which is um, you don't. Eve doesn't know what the initial state was, so she sends in um, a maximally mixed state, which represents her ignorance about the initial state. Um, she runs, um, so she see, she forces the measurement outcomes by applying the projectors corresponding to the measurements that she, that she actually saw in the experiment. Um, and then um, with those projectors, she decides, OK, I'm going to apply those projectors to both of these possible states or any of these possible states, ren possible inputs. Um, and she's just going to pick the one with, with, with the biggest norm. So that's so with unbounded resources, that's um, that's the algorithm that uh, you would use in order to, um, to figure out um, what to guess. Um, and, um, and then you can see that in this, if, if you take this optimal algorithm, then if if the state, if the projected state is pure, if it's rank one, that everything else gets annihilated except for one outcome, then there's a definite outcome. That's the only thing that Eve could guess. And in that case, she's going to get it right all the time. Uh, on the other hand, if the if the state is um is is, is remains a mixture, then in principle, there's no way that um, you can make a perfect prediction because just there is some, if you like, ontological uncertainty about what the about what the state is after you applied the projectors to it. So, so that's how the purification of initial state corresponds to, in principle, being able to guess correctly versus not. Um, okay, so um, that's, um, so if you, if you take this perspective, you can go um, and think about this purification problem. Um, and we're gonna do it um, for a model that we can make some progress with, which is a random circuit um, with um, a brickwork pattern of gates. I'm going to be in one dimension, but that's actually not super important for some of this stuff. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to use this general family of, um, of, of, of charge-conserving circuits. Um, what they correspond to is they, they have a qubit, and they also have a qubit that's not got charge on it, but it just, it's just meant to make the calculation center, if you like. It's meant to give you an additional nod. To tune um, and um, and so um, the key point is there is some there is some qubit um, on every site and um, and so the total number of um, of qubits in the upstate for example is conserved and you think about that as charges you think about a zero state as an empty particle as an empty site and an upstate an upspin as a as as, a, as an occupied site uh, in the limit where this this um, auxiliary dimension is large. Um, we'll, we'll come to that in more detail. Um, there's a tractable um, stat mech model that you can solve analytically, but you can at least do classical numerics on and locate all these transitions um, pretty sharply. Um, and what you find in general is that this 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 phase diagram actually has two transitions. Yeah. Okay, what, what does measurement correspond to in the stat mech model? Yeah, sorry, measurement. Thank you. So measurement corresponds to um, I go in some particular site. And I measure if the qubit in that side is up or down. Okay, so I perform I perform a um, you know I perform a rank one projector on that side. I mean, from the stat mech perspective. Um, I'll come back to that. I've not told you what the stat mech model is. Yet. Okay, okay, you'll talk, you'll talk about yeah. that. Okay, but yes, I'm I, I'm just right now I'm just saying there is a stat mech model. I'm told you what it is, but I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, it'll be it'll be something very simple. Um, right, and so just um, 
Uh, I'm just presenting the double phase diagram here. So there's a, there's a regime, you know, there's an entanglement transition because this is a chaotic system despite the conservation law. So it has this area law of volume law transition, but also has another transition inside the volume law phase where you go from being able to predict um, what the charge is to not being able to predict what the charge is. And this transition happens inside the volume law phase. So in some sense, it's like actually doing the simulation is, is definitely a hard problem. Um, okay. So, um, so, so that's that's the phase diagram, and um, and so um, so let me um, okay. So, so this is this is just what you get if you just um, go and brute force the problem. Um, now, what you might want to do, because um, let's say you want to think about the regime where there are very few measurements, is you might want to try and come up with a, a simple-minded picture of this um, of this problem. You can think about this either as like some kind of toy model of the phase transition. Or you can think about it as a suboptimal but very simple algorithm that Eve could use um, to try and predict the charge. Um, the way it works is as follows. Um, so let's say that um, the charge is scrambles totally between measurements. So you make a measurement, then you get an independent sample um, after a while. So you just get a bunch of measurement outcomes. And what you want is you want to tell the difference between, let's say, having n particles and having n plus one particles. Um, and so to do that, you need to estimate um, a local charge density from repeated measurements with, um, with an uncertainty of order um, 1 over n. And by the central limit theorem, that's going to take you on the order of n squared measurements. Um, you're making order n measurements per unit time. And so that means that you need um, an amount of time that scales the size of the system in order to um, actually figure out what the charge is. And so that indeed is what happens um, at the rate of low in, in the low measurement limit. And so this is a sort of okay model of, of that limit of low measurements. Um, but um, but of course this this um, algorithm doesn't have a phase transition. It always gives you some uncertainty if you apply it at a finite time or a time that's less than n um, in, in the system size. Um, okay. So what we want to do is we want to do something that's um, classically simulable, but also um, you know, has a phase transition. Um, and that brings me to the stat mech model. So you think about this in two ways. You need to think about, and so the way I'm going to present it is the, the, the way it's more natural to me. Um, and that's um, what you do is you say, okay, you know, um, let me, um, I, I don't really know how to, how to evaluate the circuit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out the information about the gates. I'm going to treat each gate as being drawn from a random ensemble and I'm going to marginalize over that distribution of gates. Now, if I average over an ensemble of unitary operations, that's actually just like a decoherence process. Um, so that's like some kind of dephasing channel. And so I can replace this average with a dephasing channel. Um, and so that's, that's one way of thinking about how I simplify this model in order to get um, a classically tractable um, description. The other way of thinking about this is that if you take the limit where the cube dip dimension of the site is large, then you know each of these uh, each of these matrices is somehow self-averaging in a way that makes all the gates somehow statistically the same. So the information about gate-to-gate -gate fluctuations becomes unimportant. So there's are uh, two perspectives, but what, what both of them leave, leave you with is um, you replace the unitary dynamics, which is hard to simulate, with this dephasing channel, which is easy to simulate. So that's the that's that's um, step one. But then the key thing is you still keep the locations of the measurements. Uh, and this, I think, um, is um, it, it gets back to Luca's question. So if I just had um, if I just had the unitaries that preserved um, the total charge, or otherwise was sort of average over that ensemble of unitaries, then I would have um, a stochastic model. I'd have a stochastic process in each um, at each gate um, where my particles could hop if they were if they're hopping didn't change the occupation, didn't sort of already occupy, didn't occupy an already occupied site. In other words, I would have a symmetric exclusion process um, from the gates. Um, and symmetric exclusion process can be thought about as, um, as a bunch of, um, of, of random walkers um, that, um, that aren't allowed to cross each other. Uh, what do the measurements do? The measurements act as conditioning. So when you have a measurement of a particular site, then on that site, you saw either there's walker, or there's no walker, right? So you have a set of sites, and um, and so and what you have in the stat model is you have an ensemble of histories of a random walker. 
um, or you know, not, not a single random walker, but a, an ensemble of histories of a, of a, of a stochastic exclusion process. Um, but it's conditioned um, on the fact that each that each time you have a measurement, either every every member of the ensemble must have a walker going through there, or in each run or in each run of the experiment, um, all walkers must avoid that site. So it's like you're doing a random walk environment with a bunch of pins and holes, and the holes have to be avoided by every um, by every um, history of this um, of this stochastic process. The pins have to be passed through by every history of the stochastic process. And, and so now you can ask what's the what's the statistical mechanics um, of this um, of this problem? Uh, and you can convince yourself if you're used to thinking about um, about um, about superfluids um, or things like that, that these these guys, if I think about um, if I think about this problem in the standard way where I um, where I um, uh, average over these random locations using the replica trick, um, I get an interaction between the replicas, um, which are my different members of the ensemble, um, where they're attracted to each other, um, at, you know, because they both have to pass through the through these positions, um, and um, and so um, and so so it's a so what, what you end up with is um, is a um, is um, a problem of random walkers in multiple replicas where the multiple replicas attract each other, um, and so this problem has two phases. It has a phase where um, the random walkers in different um, replicas, it's different members of the ensemble, are bound to each other. And because they're bound to each other, the total number of particles um, in every replica is the same because they form a bound state. Um, and there's a phase in which they're unbound and sort of wander about, wander about freely at large scales. And that's the unbound phase where different members of the ensemble could just have totally different numbers of particles because there are many different ways to satisfy these constraints because constraints are not that many. And so there's a phase transition that corresponds to the binding um, or unbinding of these polymers in different replicas. Um, and, um, and so you can think about it um, either in the language of, of particles binding, or you know, if you think about these polymers as the world lines, as the phase planes of a superfluid, you can think about um, what's happening at this transition as the creation of interreplica phase slips. Um, and so that, that picture gives you the prediction that, um, that in one dimension, at least, the phase transition at which um, you lose the ability to predict the charge is a, um, is a, is a costless soundless transition. Um, and, um, and, and, yes, and, and that actually uh, agrees very well with a lot of numerical tests, which I don't really have um, time to show you today. Um, but indeed, you find the transition has like more or less universal KT stiffness jump and other uh, aspects of costless cellulose physics that, um, that we know about. Okay, so that's um, that's the stat mech model. Um, how do we um, go back to the stat mech model of the game we were playing? Um, and so once again, um, the idea is that um, if you throw out the gates, um, then um, what the stat mech model gives you is um, it gives you, if you like, um, you know, you, you send in initial state with a certain charge, um, you get a measurement record, and what the stat mech model, what the partition function stat mech model generates for you is the probability to have gotten this measurement record conditional on having sent in a state with that charge. Um, and now what remains is, of course, you've got um, you to flip this conditional distribution around, but we all know Bayes' rule, and so that's, that's, that's what you do. So you, 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 flip, um, you flip the condition around using Bayes' rule, and then you just guess, um, the, you just guess the thing that gave you the bigger, um, the bigger probability, the, the bigger posterior probability after you've, um, you've done this crank. Um, okay. So, um, so um, let me just show you how this works. So, in fact, you can do more. You can compute more than just the correct guess. You can actually you can actually compute, um, if you like, um, the um, um, the the distribution of posterior probabilities across runs experiments. So, um, if you're um, in the low measurement limit, then you're generally pretty uncertain about what happens. So, um, so most runs experiment run informative, and your posterior probability is a year ahead because the measurements haven't told you anything at all about whether it was Q or Q plus one. Um, on the other hand, as you crank up the measurement rate, you find that um, you increasingly find that um, that on a given run of the experiment, you have a sharply peaked 
um, posterior probability distribution. Um, and um, these are the good runs, and, and sort of amusingly, you also find that at least for a while, the number of misleading runs, we are quite confident what the answer is, but you're just completely wrong about what the answer is, also goes up for a while. But eventually that comes down. Um, okay, so that's that's the case where you um, where you sort of made a brutal approximation and you threw out all the information about what the gates were. Um, now you can start putting back in information about the gates. For example, you might not put in the full quantum list, but you might put in, for example, oh, this particular gate looks like the identity, or this particular gate looks like a swap gate. You can put in some amount of information about the probability that a particular gate move charge around or not. Yeah. But, but just to be clear, so if yeah. you throw out all information about the gates, it's completely equivalent to this classical process. Yeah. It's, it's completely nothing. equivalent to this classical process, right? So in the limit where you throw out the information about the gates, uh, or in the limit where you take the large Q dimension, um, and so the gate information becomes totally irrelevant because it averages out, in both those limits, um, the, the, the stat -like model is just an exact description of what happens. But now what we want to do is want to take data from the experiment, which is a qubit, experiment, right? And what you want to do is want to predict as well as we can. And so you, as, as you might expect, you know, throwing out information is not optimal, right? So this regime by throwing out the information still allows you to get the answer right. But then that fails well before the sort of information theoretic transition, the computational transition for that model, which lies um, inside the phase where you should be able to guess correctly. You just aren't guessing correctly because you threw out information. You can throw out less information and, um, and so you can do that, for example, by, um, by not marginalizing completely over the gates, but only marginalizing over some parameters of the gates. And that moves, um, that makes it possible to, to move the transition, move the computational transition closer to the true transition. Um, okay, so um, let me just um, summarize all of that stuff with this giant um, phase diagram. So, um, so in, this, in this regime um, that's to the left of the red line, um, you know, there is no way to guess perfectly because the optimal uh, algorithm would still not um, get it right all the time. Um, out here um, in the yellow region, um, you don't have to work very hard. You just need to, you can throw out the gate information, um, use this um, exclusion process classifier. So the guessing game can be won by, you know, very simple classical needs. Um, out here, you have to work slightly harder, but you can still do something classically scalable. And once again, um, you're able to do so, you're able to do stuff right. Um, and so, uh, a trend, a question that um, that's very natural is how far can you push these computational transitions towards the information theoretic transition? Um, you know, while keeping your resources polynomial and not having to like actually simulate um, the full circuit. So that's something we have. Um, some ideas about, but I um, I don't want to um, say anything about it because we're not completely confident um, about um, what we think. Um, but yeah, so so the I actually this is also this is also a thing that happens, for example, in quantum error correction. Um, the optimal decoder for an error correcting code, like the surface code, is often not a thing that you can like computationally efficiently compute. So people normally use suboptimal decoders. And just hope you're sort of deep enough, you know, low enough, uh, you know, low enough error phase where suboptimal decoders work fine, because you're so much more efficient to do in practice. But so, so this 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 phase diagram shouldn't be too surprising if you've um, encountered um, quantum error correction. Sorry, okay. what what's BSEP? Is that a sorry, yeah, BSEP, exclusion? Yeah, sorry, B, BSEP is um is this um is is this um model which I didn't introduce in detail, but basically what you do is you take each gate. Um, and you um, and you you lose its quantum information, but you but you retain the classical information about the about the probabilities for remaining on one leg versus moving to the other leg. So there's still a classical stat yeah. model. It's still a classical stat model, but now it's a stochastic. It's an exclusion process, but there's um, but there's quench randomness in it. So each each location has a left hopping rate and a right hopping rate that's different. But that difference, um, you know, it, it comes from knowledge about the gates. Um, but it's like, and that's that's a property of a given circuit. But you sort of replaced the the gate itself with a stochastic left and right walk thing. Yeah. So it's like ASAP then, or is it's it... not ASAP. It would be ASAP if the if the asymmetry is same everywhere, right? I see but asymmetry. like now I have now I'm just using information from the gates. So some gates are identity like, so they have like very low probability of moving stuff around. Some gates are swap-like. So if you come in here, you go there. 
and there's some there's, there's some property of each some intrinsic property of each gate, which is a rate over which it like moves stuff less than these are So that's the information you're previously throwing out, you're now keeping. But it's still classical. And it's still sort of tractable in the same ways. Um, okay, so that's um that's that's the, the story here. And um and so I just want to show you some of some experimental data that we took in Honeywell's quantum processor. Um, using various decoders to, um, to, to to figure out um you know what the um to to, to perform this guessing game and um, and guess and we are plotting here the probability of getting it right and you see it's kind of sharpening up it's not very impressive because the system size is kind of small but it's sharpening up um as you um as you approach um, as you make the system sizes bigger and so there's some there's, there's some hope that it would be like um, a good phase transition, or this sharpens up to good phase transition in terms of dynamic limit. Um, we also tried, um, given the nature of the problem, it's sort of very natural to try uh, machine learning techniques on it. And we do find that machine learning does, um, if you train it enough, it does it does beat, um, say the the set or, or even the bias set um, um, guessing algorithm. So, you know, this is again as you'd expect, but okay, so we, it's not, it's still suboptimal. And, um, and so it's also unclear if, um, if the training resources you need um, are polynomial or exponential. We haven't really um, been able to explore this systematically yet, but the training is like fairly intensive for a neural net that's supposed to do well. Um, okay, I'm, um, I'm close to done with um, what I wanted to talk about. Yes, let me just um, talk about, um, you know, where this um, example fits in, uh, in a much bigger family of, of, of problems that um, you can imagine studying. So um, let's imagine that you have a, a system, uh, a, a, an open quantum system with what's called a strong conservation law, which is to say that, um, that there's some there's some operator Q that lives entirely in the system um, that commutes with both the system back interaction and with um, anything that happens inside the system. This is what's called a strong symmetry because, um, because the system doesn't exchange quanta of the symmetry with the back. So imagine, for example, that you have a, um, an electronic system interacting with phonons. The phonons exchange energy, but they don't exchange particles in the system. So that's what a strong symmetry is. Um, and um, and so, um, so now you send in uh, into into this um, into this open system, the strong conservation law. You send in um, a state that's an eigenstate of the strong conservation law, um, and now you imagine running this, um, this 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 evolution, and you imagine, okay, fine, the the, the various things you can do. You marginalize over some of these operations. Um, you can um, you can perform measurements that are consistent with the strong conservation law. Um, and um, and then um, what you find is in, in all these in all of these um, systems a strong conservation law or a strong symmetry um, you have um, transitions of this learnability type where um, the measurements are either able to figure out this um, the label um, that you sent in um, or not um, the the importance of, of like this generalization is that back when you're thinking about unitary circuits it was just natural to think about all of these problems as being somehow inherently computationally hard because in order to do the exact classification, um, you would need to be able to simulate a quantum circuit. But generalizing it to uh, the case of channels with strong symmetries um, now gives you a very large family of models you think about of which many are actually computationally tractable because you marginalize over some fraction of these gates and the marginalizing over gates turns out to make turns out to reduce entanglement growth and make the model track classically tractable. Um, okay, so um, just very quickly, um, we can play this game and we did play this game um, in the case where you have a non-abelian symmetry, which is SU2. Um, and so measurements give you a singlet triplet outcome now. Um, and, um, and so what seems to happen is that um, you don't have a simple, in fact, even at the level of the entanglement transition, you don't have a simple area law phase. Instead, it seems as if, um, you know, first of all, the system always takes a long time to purify and also takes a very long time, which is um, order L squared in order to learn um, what charge you sent in. So um, right now we don't have a stat mech understanding of this transition, but we have a lot of evidence that, um, that the high measurement phase is critical 
um, has various power law correlations and so on. So there's no so understanding what actually happens in this example is interesting because some kind of new phase transition that um, that I, I at least haven't seen before. Um, and um, and so so that's um, that's basically everything I wanted to say. So um, so just to summarize, um, thinking about the property of the single trajectories gives you these new um, gives you these new quantum phases and new critical phenomena. Um, and um, and so initially you might have thought, well, these things are totally irrelevant because of the post-selection problem. Um, but um, but using um, ideas like this learnability perspective, the error correction perspective, um, you can explore these phase transitions in ways that are, in principle, at least um, scalable. Um, and um, and yeah, so the many open questions about what happens beyond the simple example that I showed you and that we um, that we worked out. Um, okay, and I want to, since I do have a few meetings with people after this, I wanted to flash um, some of the other stuff that um, I've been um, doing lately. So I've been thinking a lot about um, open quantum systems in general, um, and um, and as Luca said, I've been thinking a lot about um, fluctuating hydrodynamics. So if you um, if you want to talk about those things on my schedule this afternoon, that'd be awesome. All right, thank you very much. Actually, I had a question about the SU three example you mm -hmm. went over pretty fast. You're, you're saying there's no classical limit, or that you haven't figured out. A... Uh, I'd say there is there is some kind of classical limit, right? Because what you could do is you always play this. Um, in fact, um, the thing the, the the data I'm showing you here is from some like more or less classically tractable um, model. Um, we haven't um, pushed it very far, which is why it's not. Which is why these things don't go further out past like distance twenty or whatever. Um, but in principle, this is this is something um, right. So, so this is this is related to the thing I said in the previous slide, which is about strong symmetries. So um, when you take the single triplet example, what you can do is um, you can you can take um, these gates and measurements that are SU two invariant, and you can marginalize over a bunch of the gates, and so that gives you some kind of of, of now quantum channel that sort of projects that sort of you know uh, dephases triplet with respect to singlet, but it somehow is not as powerfully dephasing as the U one case, and so it still leaves too much information sort of undetermined. That sort of widens the critical phase. But I think the problem is not so much getting data on the critical phase; it's just having some kind of tractable step mech description that you know we can actually work with. So we wrote down some transfer matrix. Um, and I think we have some notion of what the symmetries are, but they're just like very complicated and we don't know how to take a replica limit. So it's just like not, it's a situation where you can, you can sort of, you can start playing the usual games. They just don't seem to like leave anywhere simple mm -hmm. yet. I guess a related question is, is it obvious that there's no transition as a function of the cuted dimension? Um, could you imagine that, you know, the classical phase diagram, that there's something kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Really different in the yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So you might say, well, I mean, the, okay, so um, there's a multiple things that can happen, right? We know that we know that there's an area law phase out here. Mm -hmm. uh, in the area law phase, um, we know that um, that um, um, that everything collapses, and so certainly your, your charge superpositions also collapse, and so you can definitely learn when you're in the area law phase. Um, that's 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 sort of um, that's that's clear. Um, we also have strong numerical evidence that there's a regime in which um, you're just not able, even with the optimal classifiers, like simulating the circuit, to purify um, charge field positions. So both these so both these extreme phases exist. Um, as to whether the phase transitions somehow merge into one, um, I would say the the evidence we have suggests that they don't. But that 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 I would I would treat quite tentatively. It's not. It's completely possible the topology of the phase diagram is a bit different. These two phase transitions merge somewhere. But up here, the different and there's no particular reason for them to merge. If you think about the symmetries that are being broken of the two of them, just like different sets of symmetries. Yeah. Just if there is no so. The origin of this problem, if I understand correctly, is 
an attempt to reconstruct the undamaged uh, state, which is essentially error correction, right? That's, that's sort of the ideal version of this, of this, of this problem. Uh, are there yeah. any other applications that people think? Uh, um, I think that, yeah, if you, so, I mean, we're mostly thinking about this from the perspective of a, um, of, of like interesting new phases of matter. I would say, but if you're interested in applications, the stuff beyond error correction, um, there are probably um, applications in cryptography because the, the setup I was talking about was um, inherently involving an eavesdropper, right? And so the questions about like how much information can be allowed to leak to an eavesdropper um, before you have to be worried about um, the message getting getting compromised, um, but that would be the other context in which this comes about. Um, what I was talking about is not error correction because we're not correcting any errors. We, we're sort of doing the dual problem of trying to figure out. So you know, when you do so, the decoupling theorem says that um, in order for error correction to work, the environment must learn absolutely nothing about the system. So the moment the environment learns something about the system, that error correction fails. And so, if you like, you think about this this problem that we're doing as sort of um, as the dual perspective of error correction. When when the when Eve can learn. That means that errors cannot be corrected because too much information is leaked to the environment. But yeah, the, 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 these these things are closely related by sort of a shift of by a global shift of perspective. I have a very broad question. So, since you made a connection between this quantum system and these classical models, is there anything you can like that these quantum studying these quantum problems can teach us about the classical system? Um. That's a good question. I mean, um, well, I mean, not that, not that I know of that you couldn't have gotten by some other means, but certainly, um, you know, we could have asked these classical information theoretic questions um, without knowing anything about quantum mechanics. Um, and, um, and so, you know, people didn't do that because I think um, questions about, I'd, I'd say, yes, that, that, that's one thing I'll say. This is related to some recent work that um, I was doing on classifying open system phases of quantum systems. Um, there are lots of papers on things like Markov chains and conditional distributions and so on, but um, the thermodynamic limit is not such a natural um, limit for classical physics. And if you if you now ask these questions about phase transitions and so on in classical systems, many of them you know are very natural in some ways, but they just wouldn't have been asked because the thermodynamic limit is not natural for many of these classical applications. But yeah, a lot of this stuff um, has, um, you know, perfectly legitimate classical analogs. You could have figured out just proper things about conditional distributions that, um, and, you know, when they, when they sort of change their, their form, when conditioning becomes powerful somehow. Is there a way to understand what's happening at that line where BSEP no longer works? Like, is that, and is it really vertical? Um, of... It's, it's, I'd say no. I mean, I, I don't want to say too much about, I don't want to claim too much about this, this line because, you know, we don't really, so if you ask me what happens over here, um, I don't really have any way of telling, right? You know, because- Are things more quantum though? Like, is it, you don't have a kind of underlying incoherent way of thinking about the difference. I mean, so if you ask, okay, so you can ask what happens to the left of this, yeah. right? And to the left of this indeed, what happens is that there are basically interferences between subsequent gates. So if you take each gate and replace it with a stochastic um, process, you miss the interferences and you, and you screw up mm -hmm. um, your amplitudes over like reasonable distances. So you, you could ask, you know, how am I going to do better than BSEP, right? And the way you do better than BSEP is you sort of only marginalize over some fraction of the gates. And if you marginalize over some small fraction of the gates, you end up with some pretty, um, you know, I think Liang has some results on this, right? Um, basically on, on the simulation of quantum systems in the limit of low noise. And already in some sense, it goes from being a hard problem in the noiseless case to being an easy problem, um, of very small amounts of noise. So probably the way you'd be, be set here is by exploiting that fact and sort of just marginalizing less. So you sort of good, your, your transition amplitude in a big patch are good. Um, and then and then you know, then you can make the patch as big as your computational resources allow you to, and you can sort of get um pretty close to here, but you probably won't go all the way there. Yeah. 
Can I ask a question about if I think this as some channel, mm -hmm. usually in error correction, there's some like channel capacity, right? So yeah, yeah. How many qubits, what's the fraction of logical qubits in Kinko? Yeah. And here it seems it's kind of black and white. Either you have a channel or there's nothing you can encode. Is it something corresponding to like some continuous change of channel capacity? Yeah, no, I think so. So I think I, I didn't talk about this um, in detail, but like certainly um, in the in the limit. So it's not it's not really the case that um, that you're um, completely unable to encode information. It's that somehow um, there's some irreducible noise in the information you're encoding in the fuzzy phase, and so channel capacity is less than the maximal channel capacity. In the sharp phase, so it's like you think about the channel about the classical channel capacity. Because ultimately, this is this is yeah, a classical right. information transmission problem. So classical channel capacity goes from like effectively noiselessness limit to like being noisy. But it sort of it, it decreases smoothly from from like the maximum value to like nothing when there are no measurements. I see. Okay. Thanks. If there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Sarah again. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it was uh, good. One of the things I didn't even realize I scheduled two weeks ago. And suddenly it's like, oh, it's already done for three weeks.